Welcome, everyone. Um, before we get started, I'd like to go over some emergency information for those in the room. Uh, please look around now and identify the two exits that are closest to you. In some cases, an exit may be behind you. And in the event of a fire alarm, we are required to evacuate this room immediately. Please take your valuables with you and do not use the elevators. While staff will endeavor to assist you to the nearest exit, you should also know that you may find an exit door by following the ceiling mounted exit signs. Evacuees will exit down the stairways and possibly to a relocation site across the street. If you cannot use stairs, you will be directed to a protective vestibule inside a stairwell. Should we have to relocate out of the building, please obey all traffic si signals and exercise caution crossing the street. Uh, I also would like to go over some housekeeping details before we get started. The uh, drinking fountain and restrooms are located out the doors at the back of the room. Go to the left, the left past the glass sculpture hanging from the ceiling. The drinking fountain and restrooms are located there on the right. Food service is available in the building on the first floor. Take the grand stairs to the first floor and at the bottom of the stairs, stay to the right. The cafe is located across the lobby from the security desk. As you might imagine, we also strongly encourage recycling efforts in this building. <laughs> Please look for the green and tan three-in-one containers located outside the doors at the back of the room to recycle your papers, cans, and bottles. It's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker today, Dr. Erica Houts. Uh, Dr. Erica Houts. <laughs> Erica received a Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering at Ohio State University in 2007, in which she graduated magna cum laude with honors and distinction. She then went on to receive her PhD in environmental engineering from UC Berkeley in 2013 under the direction of Dr. David Sedlak. During her graduate career, Erica developed a novel analytical chemistry technique called the total oxidizable precursor, or the TOP assay, that is now considered to be one of the most widely used and effective means of detecting the vast majority of PFAS compounds, including the non-discrete and difficult to measure PFAS. Dr. Houts is a senior environmental engineer at the consulting firm Arcatus, where she is the anal analytical lead on PFAS sampling, analysis, and treatment. And if, any if we have any questions from the online viewers, you can send your emails to auditorium at calepa.ca.gov. And with that, uh, here's Dr. Houts. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you, Scott. I should just note that I am getting over a bit of a cold, so pardon my scratchy voice. Um, it's nice to be back at Cal EPA. I, between my PhD and my time at Arcatus, I worked for DTSC in Berkeley in the Environmental Chemistry Lab. And I should note that in that lab, they've been doing excellent uh, PFAS, particularly biomonitoring research, um, for probably a decade. So shout out to my former colleagues there. Um, just need to find the clicker. Ah. Okay, so today I'm here to talk to you about um, both in situ and ex situ treatment technologies for um, for PFASs. That will be the main focus of the presentation. Um, we will do a quick introduction on PFAS, mainly focused on some of the properties that will affect the performance of these chemicals in the different um, treatment technologies that we'll discuss. Um, also, briefly go over analytical methods that can be um, used to assess the performance of these um, treatment methods and also underscore the extent to which um, some of these are standardized or not. Um, then I'll give kind of a broad overview of the state of PFAS treatment and then go into some of these specific technologies, how they're performing, and in a couple of cases show some case studies. And then we'll conclude with take-home messages. Um, so I always like to start with talking about where uh, major locations of PFAS point source contamination may be. I think this is significant because we hear often that PFASs are in all kinds of products, and, um, and while that's true, there are still locations where we can expect elevated levels that will require some kind of management. And so um, primary manufacturing is certainly one of the biggest sources of PFAS point source contamination, and this would be locations where PFAS chemicals are actually manufactured. And I noted that in California, you guys will be investigating this as part of the phase two water board plan, or phase two of the water board PFAS investigation plan. Um, and I was interested to hear that you guys didn't think there were any primary manufacturing locations, which is also my understanding within California. 
Um, also, secondary manufacturing, where these chemicals are applied to different kinds of products or perhaps blended. Um, military fire training sites are uh, a big location of PFAS um, contamination, and I would say the DOD has been very ahead on investigating their um, potential impacts and assessing that, and I don't believe that's part of the phased investigation plan. Also, airports. And then I'm listing a number of other potential sources where I would say we don't have a good understanding at this point in time of, of the extent to which there are major PFAS point sources. These include municipal fire training areas, refineries, bulk terminals. These are all part of the phased water board investigation plan. Um, metal plating facilities, I would say we have seen in our experience that these can be rather large sources of PFAS contamination to the environment. Um, but I don't believe those were highlighted specifically within the um, phased investigation plan. And then also wastewater treatment plants and landfills, um, either just in general because they're sort of aggregators of a variety of different um, PFAS uses and consumer products or other potential uh, waste they may receive. Um, so I think the concentrations with, within those two can vary quite a lot. So when we're talking about the PFAS class, we have the um, perfluorinated part of the class, and we're usually talking about perfluoroalkyl acids. These are compounds like PFOS and PFOA, which are broadly grouped into the carboxylates and the sulfonates. There are a couple of others that would technically fit into this category, but this is the main um, focus. And then some of the newer generation compounds like Gen X are also kind of within the perfluorinated set, but um, they're not perfluorinated acids. And so all of these compounds are anionic at environmental pH. Their pKa's tend to be below three. This means that essentially they're not gonna volatilize unless the environmental pH is really low. All of these chemicals are, as far as we know, completely recalcitrant to biotransformation. So there's no real treatment mechanism that we can use to treat these compounds that's, that's based on um, a biotransformation concept. And then um, we focus on PFAS and PFOA. They have eight carbons. They can range in length um, all the way down to, I guess, a single perfluorinated carbon. Um, typically, we talk about them going up to about C14, although potentially they could be longer as well. And in general, their um, sorption potential increases as the chain length um, increases. That kind of means they're less mobile in the environment as the chain length um, becomes longer. And um, this is also, in a related way, of, uh, um, dictates bioaccumulation. So as these compounds get longer, they tend to bioaccumulate more. However, because they're less mobile once they're released, the exposure potentials are lower. So it's, it's kind of an interesting balance in, in thinking about um, the class in that context. Um, the other part of the class are the polyfluorinated compounds. They also contain a fully fluorinated carbon chain, just like the PFAAs, um, but they can have a variety of different functional groups. There are several thousand compounds that have chemical abstract service numbers. I think a lot of the customization for different kinds of uses comes in this non-fluorinated part of the molecule that we see in the polyfluorinated compounds. And because these can be many different kinds of structures, their transport uh, is much more variable than what we could say about the um, perfluoroalkyl acids. And because these compounds have this non-fluorinated part of the molecule, that renders them more susceptible to biotransformation and also to a number of um, abiotic chemical treatment types of processes. So we tend to see that these telomer compounds form the perfluoroalkyl carboxylates um, through biological reactions, and we see that the um, sulfonamide-containing compounds, that's that structural group that's highlighted in gray, tend to form compounds like PFOS. Um, I also just want to point out that for these, these polyfluorinated compounds, they'll never form a perfluoroalkyl acid that has a longer um, perfluoroalkyl chain in them than the precursor itself, so they're not additive in that sense. So the way that we um, investigate these compounds, uh, particularly those of us who are really focused on using standard methods, in the US we have one US EPA method, that's 537, it is for drinking water. Um, four new compounds were added to it, I believe in November or December. Labs are still in the process of bringing that as part of their certification online and available to customers. The four new compounds were 
um, more of the, I guess, newer generation compounds that you may have heard of, like uh, Gen X and a compound called Adana, which is a, another PFOA, PFOS replacement. Um, often we're trying to analyze media like groundwater or soil that 537 is not applicable to. So usually people will, or commercial laboratories will refer to these methods as modified 537. That's just sort of a short, shorthand for saying it's a PFAS method. And um, because the Department of Defense has been investigating PFAS impacts for a long time and really would like to collect good data on the first time, they have added some um, standardization elements to how laboratories analyze for these compounds in environmental media to this document called the Quality Systems Manual 5.1. It just had a, an update uh, to 5.2, but the labs are still certified for 5.1. And so that kind of offers some standardizing features to how to look for these compounds. And it uses what we would consider to be the, the gold standard for these compounds, which is isotope dilution for quantification. There's no standard methods for air or for tissues. Um, CDC does have a, a human blood method that a lot of people use. Um, and the draft EPA methods for soil and groundwater have been an, announced, but I don't believe presented publicly yet. Um, but they've been kind of in the works for a number of years. So because all of those methods look for a discrete list of PFASs, sometimes people want to look for kind of the complete PFAS mass picture. These are different techniques that can be used to do that. Um, the total oxidizable precursor is a technique that converts the polyfluorinated compounds to the perfluoroalkyl acids. And by measuring a sample before and after that process, you can look at the difference to understand the total concentration of polyfluorinated compounds in that sample, or of precursors. It's very specific for PFASs. Uh, and there are a number of laboratories that uh, offer this commercially, although it is not standardized. The next two methods both measure total organofluorine. Um, they are not specific to PFAS, which I'd just like to point out, because if you're using them with a media like wastewater, where you might expect other kinds of fluorinated organic compounds, you're going to pick up the fluorine from those compounds as well. Um, another tool which I would say we mainly think about in either an exploratory context or a forensics context is high resolution mass spectrometry. Um, this is not a tool that uh, is available to for PFAS analysis at most commercial laboratories. Uh, it's used more in an academic setting, and it's a way to tentatively identify any kind of um, fluorinated compound that might be available. It, it's definitely specific for PFAS, but in order to definitively identify something with this technique, you will need a, an analytical standard to reference. So with that as the context, um, let's move on to treatment. Uh, first, I want to talk about some of the challenges and some of the things that I won't be covering and why. So particularly for the perfluoroalkyl acids, these compounds are very recalcitrant to um, typical chemical treatment processes, particularly advanced oxidation processes. Um, the carboxylates can be broken down under certain conditions with sulfate radical. Um, but that's still kind of in a pilot phase at this point. Um, reductive processes seem to be more applicable to these compounds, but they're hard to implement in the, in the field scale. I will say that precursors can partially, partially break down through various um, chemical oxidation and reduction processes. Biologically speaking, the perfluoroalkyl acids are totally resistant to biodegradation. We do see that the polyfluorinated compounds will biotransform, and usually when that happens, they'll shed a, fl a fluorine or two, or three or four, depending on the compound. Um, so that can be one route of kind of lowering the, the fluorine content of some of these compounds. But it doesn't completely solve the issue. And then physically speaking, um, we don't always know how all of these chemicals will perform with adsorptive processes, or rather, we tend to know that the performance decreases as the chain length decreases. And depending on the exact structure of the precursor, there's some unknowns with a lot of the precursors as well. Um, another thing to highlight is that processes involving like air stripping aren't relevant to these most of these chemicals because they're not volatile. Um, so I wanted to kind of lay the framework out for the different types of water treatment technologies that we see on a range from that are more experimental to mature, mature being that we could, you know, 
potentially put them, de design a system and put it online for a client who, who has a PFAS issue, and from not viable to feasible. Um, again, this is a little bit subjective. This is sort of how we view this as a company, but we're, we're trying to take a pretty critical eye to what we can really think will work. So the top right corner is probably what you want to focus on. These are the treatment technologies that we know work really well and that are feasible. And that would include activated carbon and ion exchange. Um, they don't necessarily work really well for everything, but we, we have a sense of how they perform for a lot of these compounds. And then in the ring around that, um, we have reverse osmosis, which is a pretty mature technology in the context of PFASs, but sort of less feasible often just because of the cost of implementing it. Um, similarly, synolysis is becoming more mature in the space of PFAS, but requires a pretty concentrated solution to be economically viable. Incineration is a mature treatment technology for PFASs, but there are concerns around whether these compounds are completely destroyed in incineration. And similarly, uh, electrochemical oxidation and a process called ozofractionation are some that I will uh, discuss uh, going forward in this presentation. Oh, one other thing to highlight is the ones with a black box around them are separation technologies or adsorption technologies, and the ones with a blue box around them are destruction technologies. And you may notice that we don't have any blue box technologies in the far right. So we have fewer options available for soil and sediment. Um, soil stabilization is probably the most uh, feasible and mature technology we have available to us. But that said, there's still a lot of ongoing research as to um, what would be the best uh, types of constituents to stabilize these compounds with. I'll discuss that in more detail as we go forward. Same issues around incineration for soil as we have for, for water. Um, and then ex situ thermal is a, is a pretty interesting um, area for soil treatment. Um, but it's, it's not, I guess, as mature as we might like to recommend it on a widespread basis yet. So these are the uh, conventional treatment technologies that we can use for PFASs. Most of you are probably aware that GAC or activated carbon is the most widely used treatment technology. Um, it's pretty effective and you can put it online quickly. That doesn't mean there aren't going to be better or more cost effective options available. Similarly, ion exchange resins, particularly anion exchange resins, um, can exploit the uh, charge properties of PFASs to separate them out of water, um, and then reverse osmosis and nanofiltration. In terms of what's coming online, what's in development, uh, synolysis, plasma treatment, electrochemical treatment, these are all destructive technologies that are active areas of research, and then also um, this ozofractionation technique, which is a separation technology. So the Department of Defense, through their CERTIP ESTCP program, is funding a lot of the um, uh, the research around PFAS treatment. So I just wanted to highlight what the projects are that they've funded so that you get a sense of at least where they see some of this um, moving forward. So the top two are um, UV-induced defluorination and electrochemical destruction. These are both destructive technologies, but as you can see, they make up less than 50% of what's currently being funded. The rest is kind of focused around um, novel adsorbents and then ion exchange uh, resins and the ability to regenerate them. So we're going to break the uh, treatment discussion down into three categories. The first is adsorption or separation, where you're physically taking the PFASs out of the media. You then usually have some kind of a waste stream that's a lower volume that you'll have to deal with. And then um, fixation, where you're leaving the PFAS contamination in place, but trying to do that in such a way where you're protecting potential receptors. And then finally, destruction. Um, so. Uh, GAC is, uh, has been the most widely used treatment technology for PFAS so far. It's pretty effective at removing PFAS and BFOA. There's different kinds of GAC, but generally we're seeing that bituminous or coal-based carbon tends to outperform the other varieties. GAC works pretty well for low PFAS BFOA concentrations. I mean, it will work reasonably well for higher concentrations too. You'll just have to change it out more frequently. Um, it's important to consider what the water geochemistry is. There are other things that would like to uh, utilize the GAC. Um, sometimes pretreatment can be required. 
Um, however, despite the fact that GAC works for PFOS, PFOA, it's not exactly an amazing technology for PFOS, PFOA. There is a lot of other kinds of compounds it would like to pick up before PFOS and PFOA. And then we also see that there's much less effectiveness for um, shorter chain uh, carbons. And in some systems, you can accumulate radionuclides if they're in the source water. So that's another concern around GAC, particularly if you're installing it in somebody's home that might have those um, compounds present in their water. You can deploy GAC pretty easily. You can do rapid column testing to sort of assess how it's going to work with your particular water. Um, so you can size and design the system appropriately. Um, I would say the biggest challenge towards implementing GAC is if there's a lot of uh, organic carbon in the water or if there's a lot of metals, and, and in which case you will need to do a lot of pretreatment design in that case. Um, so this slide is a reproduced slide from a, a Water Research Foundation study um, showing the treatment of three different PFASs through a GAC system. And there are usually two, two vessels in a GAC system, a, quote, lead vessel and a lag vessel. So the first vessel is there to really pick up the bulk of the mass. The second vessel is there to capture any residual PFAS to um, delay breakthrough times. And usually you'll measure the PFAS between those vessels. And when you start seeing breakthrough in the lead vessel, um, then you'll, you'll um, switch that one out and keep the lag vessel in place. So that's what's happening in this image. And the, the top um, compound is PFPA. And that compound you can see breaks through the most rapidly. So once we get over C over C naught of one, that means the compound is breaking through above the concentration that it was in the influent water at. We see that um, PFOA is the next to break through, that's pretty typical, and then, and then PFOS. So one of the, the biggest things that affects how useful these systems are is, is how frequently you need to do GAC changeouts because that's very costly and, and, and adds a lot of O&M costs. So you need to kind of appropriately design the system to um, you know, make sure that change out frequencies don't have to be excessively high. Um, ion exchange resins are another pretty mature technology for PFASs. There's, there's different kinds on the market. Um, they don't all perform equally well, uh, but it, it sort of depends what your source water is. Um, these are also very effective at removing PFAS PFOA and tend to have better effectiveness for a wider variety of anionic PFASs, like the shorter chain ones. They tend to have, these systems tend to have a smaller footprint, which can be helpful if you're space limited when you're designing a, treat, a treatment system. They're also somewhat sensitive to the specific um, site water, particularly if you have um, site water that's high in anionic compounds, like inorganic ions, that can um, create some operational challenges with your ion exchange system. And the one thing people are pretty interested in with ion exchange is regenerating the media as a way to kind of save on that cost. However, in most cases, people are using them as single use. Um, so what we're looking at on this slide is a comparison of, of GAC and ion exchange resins. The y-axis is gallons before you, you see breakthrough. And so you can see that with this particular ion exchange resin, um, we're seeing breakthrough occur much more slowly with the ion exchange resin compared to GAC, but that difference sort of declines as the PFOS and PFOA load increases, and that's sort of typical. So this kind of makes the case for ion exchange resins. The only caution is that ion exchange resins are also much more expensive, so you kind of have to do this cost-benefit analysis of is the extra expense of the media worth it in terms of performance, and if you're having to change out the media less frequently, um, that may be worth it, particularly if we're talking about systems that are um, installed in somebody's home on their drinking water. You don't want to have to get into their home too often to um, service these, these systems. It can be really helpful to have a system that has lower uh, change out requirements. Um, so another type of media are, that's in development are these poly, polymeric adsorbents. Um, this is just an example of um, one set of adsorbents that a, a partner of ours at um, College of Worcester, Paul Edmiston, has been developing. They're um, siloxane-based adsorbents, and um, these are used kind of in lieu of anion exchange or, or GAC to sorb PFASs. And we find that, in particular, these poly-QA, the quaternary amine um, adsorbents, work really well. 
And so this is an example of the performance of these, or their, their um, adsorption capacity in comparison to GAC. We see that um, the, the red, sorry, the orange bars are the poly quaternary amine osorb, and these perform um, much better relative to GAC, particularly for the shorter compounds or the compounds that don't work as well with, um, with GAC or possibly with some ion exchange resins. So this is an active area of research. This is one of those focus areas that DOD has been funding. The last separation technology I want to talk about in the context of water is reverse osmosis and nanofiltration. Um, this is probably the best across the board treatment technology for PFASs. It's really effective at removing both, uh, I mean, I'm using them interchangeably. Technically, there are two different technologies, but they're um, relatively similar in terms of their performance. Um, and these, both of these treatment technologies are very effective in removing both short chain and long chain PFASs. We haven't seen a lot of data for precursors, um, but we do expect to have a, they'll have a similar performance with precursors. Another benefit of these kinds of treatment systems is that you can install them in a home. And again, a lot of the places that are actually actively doing PFAS treatment at, at this point in time are people on private wells who've had their, their private wells contaminated and, and need kind of immediate drinking water treatment. Um, some of the disadvantages of RO and NF are they tend to be pretty expensive and have high energy costs. Uh, their membranes are susceptible to fouling um, and may require pretreatment. That's true of a lot of these technologies. Um, and then you'll also end up with a um, reject date or a retent date that will then require disposal and that will have associated you know, costs with it as well. Um, in terms of separation technologies that are applicable to soil, Soil washing is um, one of the main ones I'm going to cover. This is a physical separation technique. It's basically just like what it sounds, where you'll be pulling soil out of the ground and, and washing it with some type of, um, of leaching solution. There's um, been some studies that suggest this can work for PFAS. It depends a lot on what you're, what you're using to wash the soil with. Um, uh, it tends to work better for coarse grain soils rather than fine grain soils. And it's unclear how well this will work for some things we may be concerned about, like cationic precursors that are really sorbed in, in um, source zones. I would say this is not a, it's a mature technology for some compounds, but not for PFASs at this point in time. And actually, there is one more water treatment technology I'm going to cover. This one is called ozofractionation. And um, I would, I guess I would say picture a fish tank and that, that bubbly um, uh, water that comes through in a fish tank, it looks kind of like that, the way it's operational. And essentially you have um, feed water coming in and as it goes through these uh, various tanks, you're bubbling in ozone in the bottom. Because PFASs like to partition at the air-water interface, they go into the bubbles and then as the bubbles rise, they kind of the PFASs rise to the top of these columns. Um, the ozone is not there to break them down, although it can partially break down precursors. And they also can um, be helpful in treating, ozone can be helpful in treating co-contaminants that are organic. The ozone will also oxidize metals, which will come out of the bottom fraction. So um, you run this in series, kind of like a multi-GAC system, just so you get extra enhanced removal through each of these chambers. And then at the end of the system, you, you treat the final treated water with some kind of um, adsorbent or another type of polish if you need a really low um, uh, treatment goal. So this is an example of what this system looks like. It's a system that we installed in Australia, in, um, in Brisbane. At the time, we were treating a really recent um, major AFSS bill that had impacted a sewer, so it was um, a bunch of wastewater from that sewer was stored until it could be treated to, it, um, to such a level that it could be discharged. It was 3.6 million gallons in total, and this was a pretty challenging water to treat because it had a lot of um, organic carbon in it. And because of the jurisdiction where this was located, they actually mandate top assay testing in that jurisdiction. So we were using top assay to assess the um, performance of the treatment system. Uh, in this case, I would say that was a very applicable technique because we were dealing with a really new AFFF spill that had a bunch of 
chlorotelomer compounds that are not detectable on, on standard methods. Um, we did a pilot scale design, and then when we took it full scale, this is just an example of the type of data that we were seeing. So the influent contained, on average, or at least in this particular sample, 29 micrograms per liter. So this is, we're in micrograms per liter, so 29,000 nanograms per liter. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, through the three ozofractionation, ozofractionation chambers, we were able to remove 98% of the PFAS as measured by top assay. Ozofractionation works really well for long chain comp compounds, works slightly less well for some of the um, shorter chain compounds. This is a common theme with a lot of these treatment technologies. Then we use nanofiltration to bring the um, treated water down to our treatment target, which was um, 250 nanograms per liter. And so you can see with the treated water with nanofiltration as a polishing step, we were all not detected at that point. Um, and we're able to achieve 99.99% removal of the PFASs through this system. So we started out with 650 tanks of water that we had to treat. By passing it through the um, treatment system once, we were able to bring it down to 21 tanks. And you can see on the, uh, the left axis, this is the total PFAS concentration rising as it goes through the system. So it started out with a pretty low level. Um, and then as all of that contaminated water is getting concentrated, the, the level is going way up. And so then we took all of that treated water, or all of the, the fractions off of the first round of treated water and passed it through again one more time and were able to um, uh, bring down the final amount of waste to two tanks. The reason why this is important is because when we're talking about destructive technologies or ultimate disposal of PFASs, uh, a key goal is to take a high volume, low concentration waste and concentrate it into a low volume, high concentration waste so that it's more efficient to treat it, both from an economic point of view and just an, an energy and life cycle, you know, footprint type of point of view. Moving on to fixation. Um, this is again where we're leaving the PFAS in place and managing it so that it will not impact receptors. So um, the main uh, topic within this category is soil stabilization. And this is where you mix different kinds of reagents into a soil column so that it will help retain the PFASs within the soil so that when, when um, rainwater and groundwater infiltrate the soil, they won't be um, picking up any, any PFASs as they move through. Um, particularly when you're talking about a really large scale soil contamination, this can be a lot more practical than excavating and sending it to a landfill or, or incinerating it. Um, but I do want to be clear that the PFAS are not destroyed. They're just um, managed in place. And so we're currently doing some research on the most appropriate type of reagents to use for soil stabilization. This is just a, a photo from our bench scale testing. Um, we were testing four different kinds of fixants, um, aluminum hydroxide, we're, we're going for pos positively charged um, minerals that can retain the negatively charged perfluoroalkyl acids. There was a, a modified organoclay. And then we were testing different do doses. So this is an example of one of our bench scale results. Um, I just want to point out we're looking at concentration in a log scale. So the baseline sample contained, or, or when it, the soil before it was treated, it would leach on the order of um, 100 to 1,000 nanograms per liter of different PFASs. This is from like an AFFF site. And then when we treated it with these um, three different amounts of organoclay, we saw significant reductions in the amount of PFASs that would leach out of the soil. Um, so we saw sort of the best removal for the long chain, or the best um, permanent fixation for the long chain compounds and um, sort of less fixation for the shorter chain compounds. And then this is sort of a similar outcome for the aluminum hydroxide GAC uh, mixture that we were looking at. Um, so we saw a slightly better removal for the, the previous um, reagents. So then we took these bench scale results and we have brought them to the field to do kind of a pilot scale design where we have different soil plots where we're amending um, different 
percentages based on the outcome of the, of the lab scale trials into the soils to um, monitor these over time. I think the duration of the study is uh, a couple years to see how effectively these things retain, uh, or these different mixtures retain PFASs. So there is a concern that this could be a somewhat reversible process, um, and that's kind of the biggest thing that has to be proven with stabilization is that you're, you're permanently, relatively permanently retaining the PFASs after you, you mix these reagents in. And so this is just immediately after our, our pilot scale um, test was initiated. On the left, we're looking at um, just mixing the soil with Portland cement, this was to add stability to the soil, so you can see that we're getting a lot more leaching out of, this, out of the samples that were stabilized with Portland cement than we are with these various other um, reagents. So, so far it looks good. This is an ongoing field trial where we're, again, we're trying to assess how permanently this will work. And then finally, moving on to destruction, um, this is probably what most people would like to be doing, which is permanently destroying all the PFASs. So we're gonna go over some of the different technologies that can do that now, and then hopefully can do that in a way that's economically viable in the future. And I'm gonna be talking about a lot of um, technologies that for other kinds of contaminants, we would never even consider going down that road. But PFASs are a different animal in terms of their stability and are putting previously um, unthinkable types of technology on the table to consider for destruction. And, and, and what's the driver on this? So we're just looking at, in the green bars, the cost of incinerating different um, amounts of, different volumes of uh, PFAS containing waste at $1.80 an hour, or sorry, $1.80 per gallon, and then associated energy costs. The goal is to get some of these more innovative destructive technologies online so that we can can reduce the total energy consumption. So some of the ones that we're gonna discuss are um, synolysis and electrochemical treatment. ARP stands for Advanced Reductive Processes. This is not one that I'm gonna get into, but um, at any rate, this is, this is the driver. Try and find something that's destructive, that's more cost effective, and hopefully more reliable than incineration. Um, so this type of technology is, is pretty interesting. I'm not sure how many of you guys might have seen something like this, this before, but this is ex situ thermal desorption and destruction. So essentially the soil is pulled out of the ground and put into a treatment unit that heats the soil to about 600 degrees centigrade. That's enough to desorb the PFASs into the vapor phase. And then once they're in the vapor phase, that, that vapor phase can be heated up to an even higher uh, temperature that's capable of destroying the PFASs, or it can be um, a transfer to a liquid form for treatment in the liquid phase. Um, this is a, a vendor that offers this technology. We don't have any affiliation with them, but they're one of the few out there that are doing this. And I believe they're located um, south of San Francisco. This is VEG, Vapor Energy Generator. Um, and, and this is just one of the people who, who offers this um, technology. So it is something you can bring to site, which is helpful because shipping of a bunch of soil is also um, quite costly. And so this is just some data that, um, that they've presented in some of their, their technical literature. Um, what we're looking at in the, the blue trend line and the gray trend line are two different drums of soil that they treated with this technology. Um, so that's why it says pre. Um, they originally contained around uh, 50,000 micrograms um, per kilogram PFOS. PFOS is usually the, you know, the toughest nut to crack and the one that we're, we're most concerned about at a lot of sites, frankly. And in, in this data that they were presenting after 30 minutes of treatment at 1750 Fahrenheit, sorry, I don't have that in Celsius. I know we've been talking in Celsius. Um, but at any rate, they were able to see um, really good destruction in the soil that they measured afterwards after this treatment. Um, we definitely think that this kind of technology needs to be presented with a complete mass balance, either through um, demonstrating the removed PFASs in the vapor phase or some type of a fluoride um, balance. And then understanding how temperature and time affect this is also um, needed to kind of vet this technology. Synolysis is another type of destructive technology that's been mainly kind of in the, in the research phase for a lot of other kinds of contaminants that's now being 
thought of more seriously as a commercial venture for PFASs. Um, and essentially, it's using ultrasound to, um, to break down these compounds. So we have some nice graphics here that my colleague put together. So sound energy is applied to the liquid, and it creates a pressure wave, um, which results in compression and um, uh, expansion of microbubbles which ultimately leads them to pop. And under the conditions of, of the way synolysis works, when these little bubbles pop, they, um, it's, a, it's a very exothermic reaction, and uh, that temperature is enough to break down the PFASs that are inside of the bubbles or on the surface of the bubble. Um, and then as we've discussed before, PFASs like to go into bubbles because of their surfactant characteristic. And so this is the way you can, you can break down um, PFASs. And so this is an example of a pilot that Arcadis has, has done um, with some mysterious uh, hertz frequencies. Um, we're looking at the destruction of PFAS over time under, under a couple of different um, frequencies. Uh, we were starting out with about 18 micromolar PFOS, and under the different, um, the different treatment conditions, we saw different levels of PFAS destruction. Um, and then obviously over time we saw increasing destruction. And then we were able to confirm that the destruction was real by um, also measuring fluoride and generating a fluorine mass balance. So, um, so we, we view this as a technology that has promised, but it's really still kind of more at the laboratory pilot phase than it is at the full scale implementation phase. Another treatment technology for destruction is electrochemical degradation. This is not one that our company is focused on at all, but it is um, a technology that's out there that seems to be viable, uh, and it's, it involves direct electron transfer to break down PFASs at an anode. Um, again, this is a type of technology, I should have mentioned this with synolysis, that we're, we're really wanting to work with a lower volume, high concentration waste rather than a large volume, low concentration of waste. That's really where a lot of the efficiencies come in. So one of the limitations of this is that sometimes you can get some byproduct generation, um, particularly with uh, perchlorate. Um, and then also this technology has some of the same limitations with short chain compounds that um, other technologies do. So just like short chain compounds don't stick as well to, to carbon, they don't stick as well to anodes, or they don't go as well into bubbles. So all of these technologies have weaker performance for the shorter compounds. It's not to say that they won't still work for those compounds, but they're not gonna work as efficiently. Um, so we have some, some fun animation my colleague made this slide do, but it's cute. So essentially we are, um, almost never thinking of any of these technologies as completely standalone solutions. Usually we're trying to find um, a treatment train that, that works to kind of find the sweet spot of each one of these technologies and bring it together. So on the bottom, we, if we have high organic water that we want to treat, we might pre-treat it with some advanced oxidation, which won't work that well for the PFASs, but which may treat a lot of the co-contaminants that will then eat up the, the GAC um, sorption sites. And then if the GAC is not providing a, a good enough performance on maybe the short chain compounds, we might stick a resin on there. And then finally, send whatever media we used, um, you know, low volume, high concentration offsite for incineration or maybe another type of destructive method in the future. And then similarly on top, when we use the ozofractionation technology to treat wastewater, we were able to get really good removal, but not really good enough for the discharge limits that we had to use at that time. So we added on RO and F to kind of get to those really low levels of um, treatment that we needed. And then we used the ozofractionation um, concentrated waste uh, as part of our synolysis experiments to, to work on um, destroying that. So just to wrap up, um, here are some of the treatment water treatment takeaways I want you to have. Um, these compounds are, are special. They certainly, you know, it's not like we've never had any contaminant that never presented challenges. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna suggest that we haven't had challenges in the past, but we don't have any biodegradation potential for these compounds, so we're not talking really ever about in situ bioremediation. Um, we can't treat them with injections of persulfate, for example, um, because or at least not the sulfonates, because they don't break down. 
um, with chemical oxidation. And we can't strip them out of groundwater using an air stripper because they're anionic. Um, and then the destruction technologies that are available to us, since biodegradation is not, and since chemical oxidation is not, tend to be these um, really energy uh, intensive technologies. Current state of the treatment is to combine treatment technologies as part of a treatment train. And I, I know I've, I've harped on this a little bit, but we really think that converting a high volume, low concentration waste stream into a low volume, high concentration waste stream is the most efficient way to, to handle these chemicals if we want to ultimately destroy them. And then the different categories of treatment include adsorption, separation, and destruction. Um, for soil and sediment, it's some of the same messages. Um, at this point in time, we really haven't had a lot of drivers to treat soil. Um, usually we're, we're really focused on drinking water or sometimes on groundwater. Um, so that's been a bit of a hurdle in, in piloting some of the potential treatment technologies that are on the table. So there's a, a lot of um, ideas out there that seem like they could be viable, but we're not quite at the full scale um, level of uh, demonstration that we would like to be. And then also, a lot of these technologies, including, for example, the thermal treatment one, have a pretty high mobilization cost. So to do a simple uh, field scale pilot testing can be a little bit challenging. Um, and the treatment mechanisms available for soil include fixation, so that was the stabilization that we were talking about, separation, that would be like the soil washing study, and then destruction. So finally, um, I want to acknowledge my many um, colleagues at Arcadis that are working in the PFAS space that contribute a lot to our intellectual capital there. Um, one person on this slide actually is now working for Waterboard, Erica Calve. She's in the San Francisco region, um, but was certainly a, an instrumental uh, team member prior to leaving Arcadis and in, in the, the development of some of these slides. And I think that's my last slide. So with that, I'll take some questions. Oh, right, we need to do the mic. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. That was very informative. So looking at the discussion on treatment and then the treatment train you showed, it seems to me that for the wastewater treatment facilities, unless they're doing advanced treatment, then if the PFOSs are getting into the system, they will be actually in the treated wastewater. That's the <coughs> So if you were going to prioritize which wastewater treatment facilities we ask to do testing would be the ones, the discharges that do not include RO or combination of advanced oxidation and GAC. Is that the right conclusion? So a couple comments. So you're correct that a lot of PFASs will come out in the effluent. Um, a decent amount, particularly the long chain ones, will stick to the biosolids. So one thing that we're seeing some more restrictions on these days are, um, <coughs> sorry, restrictions on land applying municipal biosolids if they have PFASs present above a certain level. So yeah, certainly a lot of them do get through the treatment system. And sometimes we actually see net production because precursors are transforming through the, you know, for example, like an activated sludge unit. Um, so you might even see effluent concentrations rise in, re in relation to influent. Um, as to where you prioritize, um, <laughs> I don't know that that's advice that I can really give. I would say that particularly with large scale wastewater treatment plants, there's, there's variability in the levels, but it's probably not as much as you might think. So um, <clears throat> unless they have a discharger coming into their influent that is contributing a, you know, a large mass of, um, of PFASs, it will probably tend to get kind of doled out um, in, in the effluent. But uh, so that's what I would say about that. <clears throat> So basically what you said, though, in between is more into biosolids than <coughs> I think the waste stream. I'm sorry. It 
had a terrible cough all week. <clears throat> so <coughs> PFOS tends to partition more to biosolids. Excuse me. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> awesome. This is exactly what I wanted to happen. So I, <coughs> <coughs> PFOS tends to partition more to the biosolids, I would say PFO less so. There's some good data in the published literature kind of on how the various compounds will, will go, including actually a paper that I published with DTSC that just came out in 2018. Yeah, somebody else asked the question, though. No. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Um, just a quick question regarding alternatives that you haven't discussed, and they may not be viable or feasible economically or, or otherwise. What, has anyone looked into um, immunoaffinity? strategies to create, for instance, a, a hapton that's common to this whole class as a perfluorinated stretch of, of the molecule and create antibodies or, or in some fashion and then create affinity, immunoaffinity columns to pull out and concentrate the PFAS. I must be honest, this is not a topic I have any familiarity with. <clears throat> it doesn't sound like something I've read about, but um, I don't want to rule it out because I'm not sure. Okay. Yes, hi. I probably don't need that. <laughs> it has um, to in order to be on the it's, it's for the webinar. <clears throat> um, I just was wondering if you go into a little more detail on the mechanisms behind the fixation process with organoclay. Like, can you just discuss that a little bit more? <clears throat> I believe it's, it's kind of a anion exchange mechanism <clears throat> happening in soils where the, um, it's the electrostatic affinity of the different fixants that are added that are adhering to, um, or sorry, that are um, attracting the PFAS <clears throat> molecules. And then there's also typically some types of hydrophobic processes that are contributing to that as well. Um, there also may be, I mean, I, I don't think mechanistically this is extremely well described at this point in time, but there's also usually a decent amount of partitioning of PFASs into the, um, at the air-water interface of the, of the pores in some of these um, materials. Hi, Erica. In terms of feasibility, I had heard about plasma treatment in terms of kind of subjecting water to really, really high heats and basically busting those carbon fluorine bonds down to fluorine. What are your thoughts on that in terms of, <clears throat> I guess, cost and feasibility? Like, is that something that seems like it would actually be an effective treatment that can be used? It's definitely an active area of research. There is a group at um, Clarkson University in New York that is, is doing some plasma research. Also, I think one at, um, Drexel University in Philadelphia. Um, in terms of the economics of using plasma, I can't comment on that. Um, but I would, I would think it's, it's within the mix of technologies that might be applicable that we're also considering, like synolysis. Erica, uh, we've got some questions from the internet. Um, Lisa Oland has asked, has distillation been considered, in particular where you have a cheap waste heat source? I've never seen anybody <clears throat> use it. I think probably because we're usually dealing with PFASs in water and, and not an organic solvent. I, I, so where I have seen basically distillation occur is in the regeneration of um, ion exchange resins, <clears throat> where they'll use something like methanol to desorb the PFASs from an ion exchange resin, and then um, use a distillation column to concentrate that down to like a super concentrated PFAS um, 
concentrate, for lack of a better word. Uh, the company ECT2 um, is, is one that's done that. But yeah, I, th I think because we're usually talking about <clears throat> aqueous um, solutions rather than um, solutions that have lower boiling points, that might be why we don't really see distillation discussed that often. We've got one more. Um, what are the byproducts that are produced after the incineration of PFAS? <clears throat> so hydrofluoric acid is CO2 and hydrofluoric acid are basically the terminal products of PFASs. And a hydrofluoric acid can be can be a relatively big problem <laughs> in an incinerator. Um, and I know that, like, for example, the GAC regenerators. Um, that is sort of a concern when they're regenerating GAC2 if there's a really high organofluorine load on the GAC that they maybe can't regenerate GAC because of the HF production. I have heard that cement kilns mitigate against that through some reaction between the cement and um, the hydrofluoric acid. Um, and then, I mean, also we maybe expect some some shorter compounds to come out of incomplete incineration, some partially defluorinated compounds. Uh, one just came in. Is incineration of biosolids an effective destructional alternative? Yeah, I mean, I think it is if you can can demonstrate that you're getting complete um, complete destruction of the PFASs. Um, again, like depending on where the biosolids are coming from. You know, you may be incinerating huge volumes, which couldn't really be, you know, viable from an economic point of view. That's kind of why people do things like land apply biosolids, because it's a sort of cheap way to, to deal with them. And I've got one more question. Um, in what instances do you think that the top assay would be most useful or informative? Uh, for example, should it be used for preliminary investigation? of say groundwater or soil or could it be used after contamination has been uh, demonstrated in, in sort of a before and after remediation uh, <clears throat> yeah so that's a good question and it's one that i get pretty often um i would say we we really don't recommend top assay for an initial site investigation for answering the kind of yes no we have a problem type of question because typically if it's a somewhat, you know, mature um, spill or release, you're going to pick up something on the list of 537 or, um, or the expanded list that DOD uses, for example. So when I have used top assay on various environmental samples, I would say usually I'm seeing somewhere between 30 and 70 percent of the mass is precursors, which means that the other percentage of the mass is something that we can detect on a regular list. There are exceptions to this. Um, this rule of thumb, I would, if it's a fresh release, particularly if it's of a composition that you know is not going to um, light up on a normal analyte list, like for example, if it's a fluorotelomer foam that um, was just released, that's where a tool like top assay might be used more um, immediately. Um, we we think it can definitely have a good use for when you're when the more when you're in the more detailed site investigation phase to do a certain percentage of samples as top assay, particularly in the source zone, so that you have your hands fully around the extent of the contamination. And then you probably noticed I don't know if I highlighted this very well, but we do use top assay to assess um, <clears throat> the when we're doing R and D on different treatment technologies. We, we use top assay in that context quite often because um, it, it helps us give a, m a more complete um, answer to whether the technology worked. Uh, and so I could see us using that in an actual site-specific context as well and not just in an, an R&D phase. If we don't have any more questions from the audience, uh, we can thank Dr. Houts. Oh, one more. We have one more question. Hi, two actually, one perhaps to the state board staff that are here. Will your slides be posted or may otherwise made available? And secondly, um, I think I heard you say, or correct me if I'm wrong, did I hear you say that 
Um, there is not a standard methodology for testing for the PFAS various chains of compounds in wastewater effluent. And if that is the case, then um, how do you know what sort of residual um, PFAS is left in, in in the effluent after whatever level of technology or treatment? <laughs> So to answer your first question, yeah, I believe there's, the slides will be available or that the webcast will be online. Um, and then it's it's true that there are not standard methods for in the, in the US um, for anything but drinking water. I suppose there are two ASTM methods that are for non-potable water, such as wastewater and soil, but they're not um, widely used at this point in time. I don't want to suggest that the laboratories aren't generating good, reliable data. I think they are um, without even, without having standard methods. That DoD QSM 5.1 document I mentioned, I think it covers wastewater. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the ideas around um, how you extract and and quantify more complicated matrices are sort of broadly applicable. So a groundwater method will often work pretty well for wastewater too. Um, so so yes, you can get wastewater analyzed. You just can't refer it to like a, a standard US EPA method. Um, within California, we actually have a lot of a lot of great commercial labs that are doing PFAS analysis who have a pretty long history. Um, like Test America is in West Sacramento, and Vista is local, I think maybe in El Dorado Hills. And there are plenty of other great laboratories uh, nationwide that can do PFAS analysis in a bunch of matrices. Including, I have an SGS person in the in the audience. SGS is a good lab too, um, and they can also do some of the matrices that don't have any applicability to the DoD QSM 5.1. By they, I mean other commercial laboratories. So there are laboratories that can do fish or can do um, blood or or air even. Thank you. Um, yes, I'd like to remind everyone online and, the, and in the audience that the video from this will be posted on waterboards.ca.gov slash PFAS. And if you have any questions that were not answered today, you can send them to the email address uh, PFAS at waterboards.ca.gov. And with that, if we could all give Dr. Houts a round of applause. Thanks.